The reconstruction and replication of a complex assemblage such as a vessel is an invaluable tool for studying the passport building technology in maritime societies. In the Western Indian Ocean, the experimental approach is particularly useful to explore the sawn plank construction technique, consisting of the use of fiber cordage to fasten each part of the vessel. Textual sources, iconography, and rare archaeological evidence indicate that this fastening method was predominant in the medieval Western Indian Ocean. These stone vessels played a crucial role in the history of this region, connecting the coastal centers of the Gulf, Red Sea, India, East Africa, and the Horn of Africa, and carrying goods, people, and ideas. Yet, we know very little about these ships. However, a scarcity of archaeological evidence for medieval watercraft in the Indian Ocean is compensated by the persistence of traditional boat building practice until recent times, including the use of sun boats in places like Southwest India. Since 1980, four sun boats reconstruction projects have been carried out in Oman, and I had the privilege to be involved in three of them. These projects relied on diverse sets of evidence, ranging from archaeological data to textual sources, iconography, and endographic records, with different research aims. Although only one can be strictly considered an experimental archaeology project, they provide crucial information on various aspects of sound plank technology because of the involvement of people experienced with this technique, such as shipwrights and rope workers from Kerala, southern India, where such vessels are still used and repaired. The SOAR was an hypothetical reconstruction of a medieval trading vessel directed by British explorer Tim Severin in 1918 in Oman. Due to the lack of archaeological evidence, the ship was primarily based on iconography and, eno and ethnographic records, and the design was borrowed from a 20th century traditional cargo ship in use in the Gulf and Western Indian Ocean called Boom. The hull, measuring 23 meters in length, was fastened with the typical Western Indian Ocean sewing technique, known as single wadding method, consisting of sewing over a caulking roll on the inside of the hull and stitches recessed in rebates on the outside. The SOAR project provided crucial information about sun construction technique, and the vessel sailed successfully from Oman to China in 1981 in a seventh month journey. The Jewel of Muscat is a sun ship reconstruction project directed by Tom Bosmer and primarily based on the evidence from the 9th century's Bellitum wreck. The shipwreck was discovered in Indonesia in 1998 and assumed to be either an Indian or an Arab trading vessel from the Western Indian Ocean sunk while carrying a spectacular cargo of Chinese ceramics, silver and gold along the so-called maritime silk route connecting China with the Gulf. The jewel of Muscat measured 18 meters in length and was sewn using the same technique observed in the shipwreck, known as double wadding method, consisting of sewing through holes along the plank's edge over a caulking roll on each side of the hull. As for the soar, the project relied on the skill and knowledge of shipwrights and rope workers from Kerala, southern India, experienced with some plank construction. The construction team also relied on other sources such as iconography and textile documents for the sails, mast and steering system. The project's main goal was to document in depth the construction and sailing of a sewn vessel fastened with a double wadding technique. The jewel of Muscat sailed from Oman to Singapore in a four and a half months journey in 2010. The same team of the Jewel of Muscat built the Ara boat in 2013. The vessel was an hypothetical reconstruction of a medieval Indian Ocean cargo ship, primarily based on the illustration from the 13th century Makamat Alariri, depicting a large, depicting a large sewn trading vessel sailing from Iraq to Oman. The construction team also relied on other sources, including archaeological evidence, such as the recently discovered ship timbers from the Islamic site of Al-Balid in southern Oman. The vessel was a representative reconstruction, its length, 13 meters, approximately two-thirds of the assumed size of the boat depicted in the Makamat. The al boat was built for the Museum of History and Islamic Science of the German University of Technology, Oman, where it is currently on display. The Ben Sayyad was the third boat reconstruction project carried out by the Jewel on Muscat team in 2012 for the National Museum of Oman. The vessel is a slightly scaled replica of a 19th century sewn fishing vessel from Oman, documented by, with a technical drawing by French Admiral Francois de Montparis in Muscat in 1838-1839. The reconstruction relied primarily on ethnographic data and offered an opportunity to determine the accuracy of Paris drawings 
an experiment with the building of frameless boat in a technique called shell first construction. Recent excavation at the medieval Islamic port of Al Balid in southern Oman have brought to light over 50 ship timbers. The builders of the city have recycled planks and other parts of boats, either repaired or broken down at the site, in the buildings of the citadel of Al Balid as lintels, shelves, and ceiling planks. The timbers have the holes along their edges in the fashion of the Western Indian Ocean sewing method and display a variety of techniques and materials, indicating that they belong to some vessels that visited the port between the 10th and the 15th centuries. Now let's have a look at some examples showing the value of these projects in offering insights for the study of the Albalit ship timbers. First of all, they offer clues about the sewing technique and the process. The sewing of the jewel of Muscat and the Alleri boat has been documented in depth with stitching history forms which recorded every vessel stitch. For example, by comparing the time required by the same team of two people to sew similar sections in vessels with different sewing techniques, such as the double wadding of the jewel of Muscat and the single wadding of the Alleri boat, we found out the single wadding technique was 59% faster and uses 35% less material than double wadding method. This might provide a possible explanation for the fact that the double, double wadding technique appears only in the earliest periods of the Albalit collection, perhaps pointing to a possible development in sewing technique to save time and material. Another aspect emerging by comparing the data from the experimental approach with the archaeological record concerns the work organization. The sewing of medium-large vessels like the Soar, Jewel of Muscat and the Alariri boat was carried out by several teams fastening small sections and working simultaneously. This evidence helped to recognize the sewing sequence in the few timbers that preserved parts of the stitching, such as the timber in the picture, suggesting that the sewing of medieval vessels was probably done in small segments as in recent watercraft. This would have certainly helped to speed up the building process while reducing the construction cost. This evidence might also suggest a distinction between shipwrights and fasteners. By relying on ethnographic records, these projects also provided information about other processes and materials associated with sewing, such as the looting substances used to seal the planking seams. Looting is a crucial element in some plank construction, but it could be easily overlooked because the stitching covers it. All these experimental projects used Dunbar in raising to waterproof the planking seams and provided analogies to interpret similar evidence on the Albalit timbers, where, instead, bitumen was used for the purpose. This evidence also offered clues to interpret the sewing pattern and technique of some Albalit timbers, since the bitumen retained the impressions of the fibers used for the wadding. These projects also provide archaeologists with insights into the methods used by medieval shipwrights to build Indian Ocean vessels. Some boats are known to be built in a shell-first technique, which consists of assembling and fastening the hull planking first and then inserting the frames. Experimenting with this construction method has produced interesting information, particularly about the various devices used by boat builders to hold the planks in place while shaping them. This consists of clamps, buttons, temporary frames to which the carpenters tie the planks, generally with ropes, through temporary holes, which are then plugged after the plank is sewn. Series of holes not associated with the sewing are found in some of the albalit timbers, either near the edges or in the center of the planks. They are usually of a different size than the, the sewing holes and not associated with rebates, suggesting that they were used to temporarily tie the planks to buttons and wedges to hold the planks in place and draw them together during the construction. These projects also provide interesting insight into the most common issues that medieval shipwrights dealt with during the construction of these sewn vessels. Experimenting with different types of wood showed one of the main risks of sewn plank construction. The timber was sometimes split along the line of the sewing holes. This issue is particularly evident in timbers with fine straight grain, such as teak, for example. Perhaps the staggered holes and sometimes confusing hole patterns of many of the albalit timbers 
might indicate the shipwright's attempt to prevent this issue. The experimental approach, combined with ethnographic analogies, also provided insights into how boat builders dealt with cracks and timber imperfections. One plank from Alba Lead shows that boat builders repaired a large crack by sewing it in the same way done by the rope works of the jewel on musket. Lastly, the splitting and cracking of the wood would have been a particularly common issue since many of Alba Lead timbers show additional holes drilled next to the sewing holes to reinforce the sewing. Experimenting with traditional carpentry and stitching tools provide insights into medieval technology and construction time. The use of traditional tools such as chisel, add, saw and bow drill in these reconstruction projects offers the opportunity to compare their marks on the timber with those displayed on the archaeological evidence. This comparison enables us to estimate the size and types of the tools used in medieval boat building as well as determine which tool was used to shape different boat parts. The tool marks on the albalit timbers indicate the use of chisels and axes with blades ranging in width between 2, 5 cm and 6, 7 cm, respectively. The comparison between traditional and modern power tools also gives us a perspective on the time required to build these sawn boats. A, te a test carried out by Babu Sankaran, the jewel of musket head shipwright, showed that a bow drill takes 10 times longer than a power tool to drill each sewing hole. Experimenting with traditional tools also shows another overlooked aspect of boat building, the constant maintenance required by these tools and its impact on the overall construction time of a vessel. Lastly, the amount of material used in these projects give us an idea of the extent of the investment required by boat owners for the building of vessels in the Western Indian Ocean during the medieval period particularly in places like the Arabian Peninsula, Red Sea and the Gulf, where timber is scarce and had to be imported. For example, ships the size of the Jewel of Musket, measuring 18 meters in length, which was probably standard size for cargo vessels at the time, used approximately 50 tons of timber and under 20 kilometers of ropes. In turn, this raw material had to be felt, transported to the coast, shipped to the various boat yards of the Indian Ocean, where it would have been worked and shaped. This aspect alludes to the crucial role of the various boat building material trade networks in the Indian Ocean. This element is often overlooked because sources and scholars have been mostly focused on exotic and luxury goods. Moreover, wood and fibers are perishable commodities that rarely survive in the archaeological record. Nevertheless, the flow of these materials would have been crucial in the Indian Ocean, enabling the construction of these vessels, which in turn would have sustained this trading system. To conclude, projects such as the Sohar, Jewel of Muscat, al Boat, and Bed and Sayyad have underlined a few important points. The experimental archaeological approach combined with ethnographic data is a great tool that offers a wide range of possible interpretation into various aspects of sound plan construction, widening our horizon on past techniques, material, and the people involved in the construction of these vessels. These projects also represent an opportunity to document a dying tradition, since sound boats are not being built anymore in the Indian Ocean, and only a handful of people are involved in their maintenance and repair. Hence, the urgency to carry out similar projects in the Indian Ocean before this tradition disappears completely. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and thank you for listening.